In case you're wondering why we're gathered here, aside from the fact that both writers have new books and both books are from the same publisher, it's because Lauren Grodstein and Tom McAllister have a few other things in common. Each of their new novels is motivated in part by loss. Both teach in the English departments of local universities, Rutgers and Temple, respectively. And both writers are very talented at their craft. Tom McAllister is a Philadelphia area native and the author of Bury Me in My Jersey, a memoir of my father, football, and Philly, which Philly sports writer Bill Lyons enthusiastically reviewed as impassioned, confessional, raw, and angry. You can probably guess which team Tom favors. His stories have appeared in the Best American Non-Required Reading 2015, among other publications, and he is the nonfiction editor of the magazine and publisher, Barrel House, as well as co-host of the podcast, Book Fight. His new novel, The Young Widower's, Widower's Handbook, was described by Stuart Onan as funny, sad, and smart. McAllister's debut novel flies along, yet reaches deep. Lauren Grodstein is the author of four novels, including the New York Times bestseller, bestseller, A Friend of the Family, and the Washington Post Book of the Year, The Explanation for Everything. She is also the author of the short story collection, The Best of Animals, which was reviewed in the New York Times as a great short story collection. A great short story collection. A starred review in Library Journal calls her new book, Our Short History, a heartbreaking, character-driven story told in the remarkable, believable voice of a courageous, sympathetic character. Please welcome our first presenter, Lauren Grodstein. Um, I'm just going to read from the beginning of the novel, because that's the easiest thing to do. Um, and it doesn't require any setup. Um, one, when I was a kid, not much older than you, I was certain I'd grow up to be a writer. I had a portable typewriter. My dad bought it for me at a garage sale. And late at night, when everyone else was asleep, I'd sit in the kitchen and painstakingly type out little scenes and scraps of fiction. I liked mystery stories a lot, suspense, moments of horror and surprising redemption. I hoped one day to write something about the Holocaust, but give it a happy ending. This was when I was a teenager and thought I could rewrite any script. Now I'm grown and know that very few of us get to become the people we thought we'd be when we were kids. I never did write a novel, is what I'm saying or even a decent short story, although I found other successes and pleasures in life and don't regret most of the things I haven't done. That said, I still have time, Jake, and I still like putting words down on paper. So I've decided to write a book for you with chapters, a title, maybe even an appendix of photographs. It seems like the right way to tell you everything I want you to know. And this island, my sister's guest house, the cloudy Northwest, it's all very conducive to writing. I have a comfortable chair here and a shiny new laptop and there's so much I want to tell you. As of course you know, this island where my sister lives with her family, Mercer Island, is all pine trees and lacrosse fields and half-calf Americanos. You can see the churning waters of Lake Washington from every direction, usually iron gray, but sometimes unaccountably blue. Seattle lies a few miles to the west. I've always thought it was peaceful here and good for us, although I do miss our home in Manhattan. Remember how I used to ask if we could build a tunnel from West 74th Street to Mercer Island? And because I thought I had all the time in the world, I used to say, maybe later. This will be a wonderful place for you to do the bulk of your growing up after you've moved here for good. You'll have your cousins to hang out with and your Aunt Allie to make sure you eat your vegetables. And your Uncle Bruce is one of the most senior people at Starbucks, which means that living here, you will be very nicely provided for. You will learn to drive, and then you'll get a car. That said, I've instructed Allison to send you to one of the public schools on the island instead of the private cloister where she sends her own kids. Public school matters to me. I want you to see how the real world lives or what passes for the real world here on Mercer Island. I can't bear the idea of you growing up amid all this privilege without some awareness that there are people who grow up on free lunch. Remember, Jacob, I spent my own childhood in a Long Island duplex, my father's, pa my father's parents in the apartment upstairs. As I've told you a million times, as I hope you still remember, my mother was the fifth daughter of a Bronx postman. My father was the only child of Hungarian immigrants who barely survived World War II. Neither one of them grew up with anything like luxury, and neither did my sister or I. Allison and I frequently discuss issues of privilege and economy. She says it doesn't mean we have to raise our kids broke just because that's how we grew up. She thinks that insecurity about money doesn't necessarily make a person more empathetic or kind. Sometimes it just makes a person nervous her whole life. And she's right. I know she's right. But still, it irks me to think you'll never understand that you are 
in some ways, so very lucky. Allison says, but in at least one way, you aren't lucky at all. None of us are. And money is no compensation. There is no compensation. I'm your only parent. I'm 43 years old. I have stage four ovarian cancer. I have perhaps two or three years left in my life. And once I'm gone, you will move here to Mercer Island to live with my sister Allison and her family. You can bring your hamster and all your toys. You can bring anything you want. You know this, Jake. You know that if it were up to me, I would live forever with you in my arms. This will be a strange exercise, this book. I can tell. As I type, I feel like I'm writing about someone else, like this couldn't be happening to me or to us. And then there, I feel the port above my ribs. And there it is again, the staggering truth. I still haven't decided how often I want you to think of me in the future, Jake, or what kind of memory I want to be. I mean, of course, I want you to remember me. I want you to remember that I existed and that I loved you and that, generally speaking, we were pretty happy. But I don't know if I want you to remember every single specific about our life together so that your life on Mercer Island always feels like your new life, as though you're comparing it to something that came before that was somehow truer. I want this to be your true life and your cousins to be like your siblings and for you to consider yourself one of theirs. I want them to be your soft place to land. This is, I think, the best thing a family can be. But I also want you to remember days like last Monday when I took you to the Woodland Park Zoo and we paid $5 to feed a leaf to that giraffe and instead of eating the leaf, the giraffe licked your hand with its prehensile tongue and you were so surprised you froze and she did it again. And this time you shrieked and I shrieked too. And then we laughed until we got the hiccups. The zookeeper said, I've never seen her do that before. You must be delicious. And you blushed a bit and said, that's what my mom thinks that I'm delicious. And oh, how you are, Jake. You, with your soft, longish hair and your feathery eyelashes, you have no idea. Sometimes I find myself daydreaming, sometimes in the middle of a conversation even, and I realize I'm imagining what you'll look like in a few years. Will your hair still curl around the edges? Will you still wear Derek Jeter Jeter t-shirts every day? Since you were a toddler, you've been huge into the New York Yankees, but then the other day I caught you in your cousin Dustin's old Mariner's jersey. I hadn't done laundry in a while. And I thought, there it is, the beginning of a kid I'll never know. The thought made me more curious than melancholy. I was like an anthropologist studying the future you. Your cousin Dustin was chasing you around the lawn while Allie yelled at both of you to come in for dinner, and I was just sitting on the dock, witnessing your life without me. Dr. Susan says the sort of witnessing is normal, the sort of floating away. You had a scrape on your shin I'd never noticed before. What time is it in New York anyway, Mom? You asked me at breakfast. I told you it was 11, and you said that's what you thought. You said, in New York, it's already the future. Jacob, I promise, if I do nothing else with the time I have left, I will write this book. I'm not sure if it's title yet. Do titles matter if you only have one reader? But I know what I'm going to include. Whatever wisdom I have, whatever lessons I'd pass on to you later if I were going to be here later when you were old enough to need them. My hope is that whenever you miss me or whenever you just want to know more about the person I was, you'll be able to open this book and read these pages and remember me, learn about me. And that way, even though you won't always be with me, I will always, at least a little, be with you. So I guess I'll start with this morning, which was a beautiful morning, the sunniest since we arrived a week and a half ago. Meteorological surprise. You and I were living in my sister's guest house with the view of Lake Washington and all those boats tied to all those docks. Across a broad, sloped lawn stood my sister's 5,000 square foot pile, cedar sink shingled, multi-chimneyed. From the desk where I wrote, I could see you playing on the lawn between the houses, hiding in plain sight from your cousin Dustin, who didn't mind that you were terrible at hide and seek. Mom! I couldn't see you, but I could hear you. Out here, I kept the windows open whenever the sun shined. Mom, where are you? I shut off my computer, bustled down the guest house stairs. You were standing with Dustin, who'd found you. You had rackets under each arm. We're going to play tennis, you said. We'll be back for dinner. Since when do you play tennis? Your hazel eyes narrowed. Uh, I've been practicing since we got here. Jake's got a pretty strong serve, Dustin said, with a flat tone of authority. I mean, for such a little kid. You do? You want to see? Of course I wanted to see. So we marched out of the cul-de-sac and down the road to the park, where, sure enough, you displayed a pretty strong serve for such a little kid. Dustin lobbed the ball back at you, and you and he went back and forth five times before you finally missed a shot. I couldn't believe it. I had no idea you'd been playing tennis. I was shouting from the sidelines like Serena Williams' father. I was a nut. Jakey, I said, picking sweaty you up despite your weight and the lingering weakness in my arms. How come I didn't know you could play tennis? You shrugged, but you were smiling, bashful. You said, I wanted to surprise you. I'm stunned, I said. Can we keep going now? You're squishing me. 
I planted myself down and watched you and Dustin practice for an hour, and even though Dustin was going easy on you, I think he was going easy on you, you raced around the court with your lithe little body, the last trace of your toddler's pot belly gone like a dream, and I saw something athletic in you I'd never seen in myself. You looked like a child, an honest-to-God child. You were not a baby anymore in any way. And when it was time to go home, you were sweaty and your knees were scraped from a half-assed dive you took toward the end. We walked up the road, the distant hum of I-90 traffic like electricity in my ears. You swung the racket, racket back and forth between your hands. That was awesome, Jakey, I said. I told you he was good, said Dustin. Characteristically, you said nothing. Should we sign you up for tennis lessons, honey, I asked. Someone was walking a huge slobbery dog toward us, more bear than canine. We paused to pet it, have some friendly Mercer Island chit-chat with its owner. After a smiley five minutes, we went our separate ways. Under an alley of willows covered in dog slobber, you said, I don't know if I can handle one more thing. During the short time we'd been on the island, my days were mostly like this, a little writing, a little spending time with you. I could have done exactly that forever, but the days felt all the sweeter because, of course, I wouldn't. For dinner in the main house, your aunt was heating up a pan of my baked ziti, which you loved and which I was trying to teach Allie the right way, to make the right way, even though I also planned on freezing like 10,000 pans of it before I went, so that whenever you missed, there would be something I made for you with my own hands, because baked ziti keeps forever. Meanwhile, I was running a bath when I heard a knock on the door. Mom, it's me. This was around the time you'd started knocking on doors, that we'd stop being casually naked around each other. I pulled my bathrobe tight. Come on in. You were still wearing your schmutzed up tennis outfit and you still had dirt on your shins. You sat down on the Berber carpet looking mournful. Jake? You're taking a bath, you asked? I just thought I'd relax. Skipping dinner? You didn't like it when I skipped meals. No, I said, I'll be in in a little bit. You nodded, looked out at the enormous picture window. In the darkening evening, your own small face looked back at you. Is everything okay? I still want you to do it. You do? It took me a second to figure out what you meant. Oh, I said, are you sure? I'm sure, you said. You tried not to meet my eyes. I suppose it must have been naive of me, but I was certain that since you were so happy here, since you were settling in so nicely, you wouldn't have any interest in my finding him. What could you possibly want with a stranger in New Jersey? You'd never even met the guy, didn't know anything about him, had always shown a laudable lack of interest in him. This was perhaps because a good third of your classmates didn't have fathers. Their moms were lesbians or 50-year-old single women who went the sperm bank route. Or maybe it's because I'd been so dementedly determined to give you everything you'd ever wanted. You never had a chance to think about this one big thing you didn't have. Super sure, I asked. You shrugged again. You fiddled a bit with your shoelace, and I remembered that I really needed to teach you how to tie your shoes better. Super sure, you said. Well, I guess I'd always assumed that the topic just wouldn't come up. The story, as far as it went, was that your father disappeared when I was pregnant, which was fine with me because I was so happy to take care of you all by myself. That happened to be true. But then a few weeks before he left for Mercer Island, I was having a particularly bad night. You found me sobbing and nauseated in the bathroom, and that night you asked if I thought I could find your dad. I told you I'd think about it and that you should think about it, too. I told you it would take me a month to figure out how to look for him. Of course, I was just buying time. I looked at the date on my iPhone. It had been exactly a month. Can you find his number, you asked? Probably. OK, you said. You look just like him. The same hazel eyes, the same soft brown hair, the same full lips. He was probably a very good tennis player. When? Soon, I said. When soon? As soon as I can. OK, you said again. And now you looked at me. You look suspicious. The boiled down version of your father. He was a one-term Democratic congressman from New Jersey, swept in by a minor Bush rebellion in 2002, swept out again in 2004. A perpetual bachelor, he was fond of Bud Light classic rock and Rangers games. He kept $1,000 in cash in his freezer for emergencies. And when you were born at Columbia Presbyterian, I remember nursing you and gazing out across the river, knowing that whatever else he was doing, he was not gazing back. I knew I could find him. I guessed he'd understand. You said you wouldn't be upset, Mom. I'm not upset, I said. You look upset. I turned to stand, I stood to turn off my bath. Jake, honey, I told you I'd be happy to do it, and I am. He's a nice guy. I hated lying, but it just slipped out. I'll call him this week. Okay, you said. You were old enough to fake empathy, but too young to really know how to feel for someone else. Thanks. You skipped out of the bathroom, leaving dirt marks on the carpet, and me to my bath. The cell phone buzzed. Allison, the ZD was ready. I ignored it, sank into the water, closed my eyes. Truthfully, Jacob, I hadn't seen your father since I told him I was pregnant. For all I knew, he was married, had a kid or two of his own. For all I knew, he was dead. No, he wasn't dead. Even a one-term congressman would have scored an obit in the New York Times. Throughout my pregnancy, a thoroughly decent one, I should say, not a moment of morning sickness, I thought about him all the time. 
I tried to imagine what he was doing, whether he was thinking about me. I was managing the Griffith senatorial campaign. This was 2006, an open seat, and I was crisscrossing Maryland twice a day, Frederick to Baltimore, Bethesda to Ocean City, pancake breakfasts, chicken dinners, standing a step behind and just to the left of my candidate, editing stump speeches, talking to journalists, doing debate tra prep, running buses, fighting for more resources from the DNC. At night, the Hampton Inn in Annapolis, the courtyard in Chevy Chase, I'd rub my belly and I would talk to you, Jake, and I'd tell you everything we'd done that day. I never called your father. I stayed true to my own dumb promise to myself. The week before the election, we were ahead in the polls by not eight points, and I knew what that would mean. It would mean a bonus. It would mean scadsmore work down the pike. It would mean I could hire a nanny and take you with me on the road in 2010, which I would, which I did. It would mean I would never have to call him and threaten to sue for child support. He knew how to find me, Jake, but he never did. You should know that about your father. He was a man who should have known he had a child on this earth and never tried to find him and never called the child's mother and never looked across the murky, sluggish Hudson to see the newborn child nursing peacefully in his mother's arms or the tears curse coursing down the mother's face. Shit, Jake. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Darn, shoot. Things are getting way too sentimental here and worse, self-pitying. I have nothing to feel sad about. I have been blessed with you and you have been blessed with me and your family is enormous here on Mercer Island with Allie and Bruce and the kids, and at home with me and Julissa and your friends and teachers and Kelly the hamster, who I hope to God Julissa is managing to keep alive. And I know as you get older, you will create an even bigger family for yourself. More friends, more loves, a partner one day of your own children. It's late. I'm shivering. I miss dinner. I hope you can forgive me for missing dinner. I feel so sorry for myself right this second. I can't even believe I was able to type. I hate self-pity. It's the most putrid of all emotions. It literally rots a person's dignity. But right now, I miss you so much, and I'm still here in this house, in this room, the same square acre as you. How could I have missed dinner with you? That's an hour we will never have again. It's the nature of this project of mine to assess where I've been and where we're all going. And Dr. Susan would say not to beat myself up about the self-pity thing. She disagrees that self-pity is putrid. She thinks it's natural and that certain situations, such as this one, for instance, even call for it. And she says that I should just ride it like a wave. Remember, she says, even at the bottom of the wave, there is so much in the world that makes you happy. You are so lucky, Karen, to have so much that makes you happy. Say it out loud like a prayer. My work, my sister Allison, my niece and nephews, the Seattle sunshine, the water slapping at the rocks below this island. You, 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 you. I press a button on my phone so I can look at your face, and then I turn back to my book, to these pages, this thing I have to finish soon. I hope I have time to write it all for you, Jake. You are my happy ending. Thank you. I want to thank Andy uh, and everyone else at the library for having me here, and Lauren for letting me share the stage here. I was um, gotten to do a lot of cool stuff with this book, but this is the one when I first, when it was first, this one felt more like a milestone, having grown up in Philly. And when I first got, uh, when I was first found out I was going to get to do this event, I think I said to my wife, "I feel like I'm a, a real writer now." Uh, so this is, this is pretty cool. Um, and this podium is just amazing. I've never seen such a podium. Um, anyway, I'm also going to read you the first chapter of the book. It's titled Chapter One. Um, and there's, you don't need much context at all, except um, most of the rest of the book is not written in second person, although this chapter is. <clears throat> you don't fall in love at first sight or first kiss even, but many months later, at that indelible moment when you awake in her bed before sunrise, her breath hot on your back, her arm draped across your ribs, the contours of her hips flowing into you, and you feel like you're two interlocking puzzle pieces built specifically to fit together with each other and no one else. The room is soundless and still, and you're afraid to move because you don't want to disturb her, so you stay there, unblinking, unbreathing, for nearly an hour until she finally shifts and grazes your shoulder with her lips, a kiss soft like the caress of a ghost. When she wakes up, you want to tell her you love her, but you don't say anything because you're terrified she doesn't feel the same way, and so you wait another month, all the while seeking the perfect way to make the grand announcement. Should you give her the same generic greeting cards that thousands of less deserving women will receive from men less devoted than you? 
a singing telegram, skywriting. You're nearly drowning in love, unable to see her without feeling your heart quivering. And at night, you cry in the shower while envisioning her inevitable rejection of you because you're too awkward or too ugly or too boring for her to want you in the same way you want her. Still red-faced and puffy-eyed, you exit the bathroom with a towel wrapped around your suddenly embarrassing body, and she reads the angst in your expression, and she asks what's wrong. In your brain, the response sounds like this. I love you, and I don't ever want to lose you. But somewhere between brain and mouth, the words mutate into this. I want to spy on you, which you immediately acknowledge as being creepy. And she tells you, yes, it really is creepy. And you try to explain that you are not actually a creepy person. What I mean is, I want to watch you, you say. And she says, that's not much better at all. And understanding that she has vaguely defined anxieties about invasion of privacy, understanding she's a more fearful person than she wants people to know, you tell her it's like this. You totally and completely trust her and don't want to spy on her in that way, but rather you want to watch her because you love her so deeply and want to know everything possible about her, even the parts of her she feels compelled to hide from you. All you want is to be entrenched in the knowledge of her and to wrap yourself inside of her being, and she says, yeah, that's still creepy. <laughs> At which point you think perhaps the only rational solution is to dive headfirst through her bedroom window and disappear forever, but then she adds, I love you too. You don't fall in love with breasts or legs or a smile, although you notice them too. You can't help noticing them the first time you see her wearing denim shorts and a white tank top on the roof of a college friend's apartment during a midsummer party, but you fall in love with something intangible. The hollowness, like a devastating hunger when she's gone, the sense of safety she engenders as if her presence alone will protect you from the terrors of the real world. Still, you're groping at each other during every private moment, and you know for her it's not because of an intense physical attraction, but because she loves something fundamental about your being. All the famous people she thinks are attractive look distinctly unlike you. They're powerful and tall and have permanent five o'clock shadows and tanned faces and smiles made for billboards. On good days, you think you're, you look a bit like a paler, less fit Paul Newman. So you make her watch The Hustler and HUD and The Sting, but she doesn't see the resemblance, and she says he's not all that special anyway. I like you much better than him, she says, in such a way that you actually almost believe her. She does not quite look like the famous people you think are attractive either, although you tell her she looks better than them, and you go out of, her, out of your way to denigrate their appearances, because the truth is she's actually the most beautiful woman who will ever pay any attention to you, and you want her to understand that she doesn't need to compete with movie people, because in your world, movie people do not exist. You don't fall in love like some people do with the idea of being in love, but rather with her specifically, and only her. Throughout high school and college, you were an extra in the movies of other people's lives, never better than the fourth most charismatic person in any group. Your role was to be the designated driver, to deliver sarcastic one-liners your friends could later uh, repeat and claim as their own, and yet when you speak, she listens. You begin telling her things you thought you'd never tell anyone, things none of your friends know and probably never cared to know. How, for example, when you were very young, you used to hide inside household appliances, then laughed while hearing the panic in your parents' voices, although that all stopped when your father caught onto your game and ran the dishwasher with you inside. <laughs> I honestly didn't know that was a joke line until everyone started laughing every time I read it. Uh, <laughs> I really, anyway, you, you find out some things are sad or funny that you thought were sad, and vice versa. <clears throat> That's where the blotchy scar on your forearm comes from. How your grandmother bought you a telescope for your birthday, but you only use it to watch the neighbor girls uh, spying on them for a solid three years until the day they left for college. How you used to chew on your toenails when you were bored, bending your leg right up to your mouth and gnawing on them. How you once shoplifted $70 worth of beef jerky from a convenience store and then fed the jerky one stick at a time to a neighbor's dog just to pass the time. The words spill out in torrents, begging to be heard by someone, and every time you think you're out of secrets, you find more and more and more, and you continually unload them, and even though you think you're talking too much, she asks follow-up questions. She laughs when she's supposed to laugh, and she says things like, that's interesting, and you should be more confident, and you find yourself over time slouching less, enunciating more clearly, projecting your voice, and charming her friends and coworkers at dinner parties and in bowling alleys. She thinks you're funny, and you think she's clever, and you retreat into conversation with her anytime the rest of the world becomes too unwieldy. Your mother calls your bedroom the shrine, and you tell her to get off your back. It's just some pictures and a few cards, no big deal. Your father says you're really into this girl, huh? And you try to play it cool by shrugging and saying, yeah, she's pretty all right. Don't you like her too? And he says, she seems nice enough, but she's, she seems nice enough, although she's not around much, and he's beginning, beginning to wonder why you're hiding her. 
Your father adds, I know how it feels to have your first girlfriend. You say she's not your first. There have been plenty of others. You just haven't brought them home. This is only about a quarter truth in that you have never brought another girl home and you've spoken to many other girls in your life and in college engaged in oral sex on five non-consecutive occasions. And anyway, there have been girlfriends here and there, but never anyone serious, just people you took to the movies or accompanied to parties. But you don't say all of this to your father because you're eyeing your laptop and scrolling through updates on the statuses of your friends' lives. Your father stands over you for a few minutes, breathing heavily due to his hypertension and his shallow lungs, and eventually he leaves. You send her a text message asking if you can visit this weekend, and she says, sure, with an exclamation point, she says it. You don't fall in love with her because she's like your mother or because she's the kind of woman you're supposed to marry, but because there is no other choice but to fall in love. She says she feels safe with you, that when you're together, she believes the world is a good and fair place because you respect her and you make her laugh and you try harder at impressing her than you have tried at, you've ever tried at any other thing. You max out your credit card, taking her on a Caribbean cruise to celebrate your nine-month anniversary, even though you know anniversaries, by definition, do not occur monthly, but as long as she commemorates monthly anniversaries, then you will too. Your father claims a cruise is the ultimate test of a relationship. If you can deal with being stuck together at sea for a full week, then your love will last, he says. Neighbors and friends seem overeager to share with you their own love tests, all oddly specific and perhaps too revealing of their own past failures. Your mother says the ultimate test is a road trip, which you also do, heading north to Maine, and you return with 300 photos in the trunk dragging under the weight of several cases of maple syrup. A coworker at the rental car agency tells you the ultimate test is looking through childhood photo albums and, you st and still liking each other, and so you arrange an album viewing night. The picture's only deepening your appreciation of her because even in her least flattering moments, she still looks exactly like the person you love. Your elderly neighbor says the real test is living together, and after a year of dating, you tell her you want to buy a house with her. She says, she says I'm not moving anywhere until I get a ring. And you say, modern marriage is just an expensive scam perpetrated by mendacious vendors, all of whom are expecting handouts in exchange for validating your love via the ornate decoration of pastries or the prompt delivery of calla lilies. You tell her the marriage industry preys on the naive dreams of girls who have been raised under the delusion that they are all princesses destined for royal weddings and that a failure to stage the most elaborate party possible will result in the failure of a marriage and therefore the manifestation of a woman's eternal unhappiness because they, the vendors, want women to believe they can't be happy or self-actualized if they're unmarried. She says she doesn't care about all that, she wants to be married. <laughs> married to you specifically, and would you stop dragging your feet already? You're 24 and it's time to start growing up. And although you think she's right, you're not thrilled about the idea of spending $30,000 you don't have on a lavish party that you yourself won't get to enjoy because you'll be too busy attending to everyone else's needs to even eat your own cake. But a few weeks later, there's the proposal down on your knee in Rittenhouse Square in Philly, a trite and unimaginative proposal. Probably there have been 15,000 proposals made in the same spot, and you apologize later for the triteness of it, the proposal, but you truly couldn't think of any other proposal that wasn't prohibitively expensive, and still now, there's the regret for not doing it right and not giving her the sweet and memorable proposal story to tell all of her marriage-obsessed friends when they ask her to recreate the moment. And then the next year, words pass with planning and house buying and congratulations and gifts and party after party after party, and the wedding and heartfelt declarations of love for each other on a Pocono mountaintop where you go for your honeymoon because the wedding and the new home have wiped out your savings, but you'll have a real honeymoon soon, you promise, as long as you're responsible and you save. You open a joint bank account and take out exorbitant life insurance policies and you buy one car to share and a king-size bed because she thrashes in her sleep and you get a new roof installed and talk about building a fireplace and installing laminate floors in the bedrooms and start repainting the kitchen and host potluck dinners and cocktail parties for her friends and family. Nights you spend naming places you'll visit, the landmarks you'll see and the memories you'll create, the photo albums you will fill so you can circulate them among envious friends and family and later pass them on to your children and grandchildren. She drafts a spreadsheet with potential dates and costs and locations, and you notify your families not to schedule anything for June 2020, because you'll be on the Trans-Siberian Railroad then, but July that year will be fine. You buy new luggage and new wardrobes, you get passports, interna international driver's license, licenses, and translation dictionaries. You research the relative strength of foreign currencies. Life becomes an obsession of planning and consolidation. You're clipping coupons and studying travel restrictions, and she's working extra hours and on exhausted, miserable nights when she can barely open her eyes because of the migraines. You tell her, I know you're unhappy now, but it will all be worth it later because you're laying the groundwork for a lifetime of unhappiness, but none of that matters. Or sorry, a lifetime of happiness. That's a terrible mistake. Uh, 
Let me start that sentence over. That's a real disaster. Let me just start the whole reading over, if that's okay. I, that's a real, that really ruins the whole momentum, doesn't it? <clears throat> You're clipping coupons and study, studying travel restrictions. And she's working extra hours and on exhausted, miserable nights when she can barely open her eyes because of the migraine. You tell her, I know you're unhappy now, but it will all be worth it later because you're laying the groundwork for a lifetime of happiness. But none of that matters anymore because she's dead, and 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 she's never coming back. Thank you. I wonder if both of these books are love letters to people in your lives. Uh, yes. Um, uh, so, co you know, covers ears. Uh, yeah, my, I mean, my, I could, my son, his, you know, I never could have written this book. <laughs> no. um, uh, so I'd written a lot about parents and children before. That's sort of been the theme that I've gone back to again and again. But I think that the whole book is really motivated by this mother's extraordinary uh, love for her son. And that was something I couldn't have accessed if I didn't know how that felt. Tom? Um, yeah, I mean, this is a book that I came up with with my wife, actually, while we were at having dinner on our anniversary and we were talking about kind of worst case scenarios, basically. Um, and I think, I mean, what motivated the book really was thinking about like, what's the worst thing that could happen to me right now? And it would, that it would be my wife suddenly just disappearing, you know, and trying to figure out how could I keep going? Uh, you know, then I made some stuff up from there, but that's definitely the starting point. Can I ask you a question? Sure. How did you not think that dishwasher thing was funny. That's really funny. <laughs> you know, it's, I had like, such is a that, problem. That's not a thing that can happen and you can live, is it? Uh, you know, that's a good, I never tested it. Okay. Uh, but that's, I had, I have so many parts of the book that I thought were very funny that people later told me were very sad uh, and vice versa. And so I think I just realized that I might, I have to recalibrate with what, how other people view the world, I guess. Because uh, there were definitely chapters later on where my editor would look and be like, you have to, this book can't be so sad. You need to change this. And I thought it was the funniest part of the book. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, so I started doing the readings, and everybody thinks the dishwasher thing is funny. So well, I'll it's, take it. It's absurd. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. Well, then let's move on to structure, because that is something that always fascinates me. Um, can you talk about how you came to the structure of the novel, and was it there um, when you initially started to write, or did it, was it the sort of thing, do you both write in a way that exposes the structure later? Because yours is a sort of meta letter. It's a handbook. Yours is in the form of this letter slash book. Yeah. Um, no, so for me, it was, I had to figure some stuff out as I was going. Like, so I, I kind of just started working on it, and um, I wrote the first couple pages pretty quickly, and um, ended up, they ended up being basically unchanged, actually, from the first draft, which has never happened to me on a good thing that I've written. And um, what happened after that is I really liked the voice of that, those chapters, but I thought having 280 pages and just the, this like tight second person would be too claustrophobic for, for a book where the main character is so sad and basically such a mess. Um, and so then I had to figure out a way to keep that while also being able to move him around. I found it, I, logistically, I found it a lot easier to move him from one room to another in third person. So for, uh, you know, um, the way the book goes is that the odd number of chapters are these sort of handbook type chapters, and then the, the bulk of the action happens in third person where he starts moving. He ends up taking uh, his wife's ashes with him on a road trip across the country, basically, to make up for all that travel that didn't happen. Um, and it just seemed, I didn't think, I didn't feel like I was smart enough to write a full book in second person with all that action in a way that would be bearable to read. So that I had to kind of retroactively make that fit. You're probably smart enough. <laughs> well, who knows? I don't uh, know. So. We'll, never, we'll never know. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, so, so Karen, the narrator, isn't a writer. She's a political consultant. So the book, she wasn't going to write a, a book. She wasn't going to have, there was never going to be a novel in her voice. The only thing she was trying to do is write this thing for her kid um, so that when he was 18, he could, if he felt like it, open it up and find out more about her. Um, and that was sort of inspired by a lot of things, but one of them, I have a, a friend in college whose mother died uh, while she was in high school of breast cancer, and her mother wrote all these letters to her that were delivered via FedEx um, at various moments of her life, like her college graduation, her wedding, and the birth of her first child. And, and interestingly, those letters became quite a burden for my friend as they got older, because it was like having 
her mother was imparting all this advice and it was hard, you can't fight with your dead mom. So you just had all this like stuff, all this one way stuff. And um, those are letters and this, is, this really is a novel with a plot, but, but thinking about those letters and what you'd want to pass on to your kid and um, what a non-writer might write all helped inform how the book was written. So your process with everything that you're doing, teaching, being a mom, when do you find time to write? I have lots of help, amazing, amazing, amazing help uh, that help that truly friends and family and you know. Um, I write early in the morning when I'm writing, so, and I'm not always writing, but when I am, it's usually like a 5 a.m. to 7 a.m. kind of thing, um, which has to happen because once 7 a.m. hits, right, like the day gets started. But I would be lying if I said, I, like right now I'm not in the middle of a book, so right now I just, if I need to write an essay or something, I try to squeeze in the time. I write in my attic where I have a really, like a vintage 1994-ish, computer that gets very hesitant email, like internet access, which is perfect. It's basically a word processor with like a clunky, sticky, food encrusted keyboard. And, um, and it does what I needed to do, which is cuts me off from the rest of the world. So in the morning, in this really kind of uninsulated attic at, from five to seven, that's, that's the good time. And then everything else, if there's more time during the day, which sometimes there is, usually there's not, I'll squeeze it in, but um, but I'm kind of useless after 2 p.m. anyway, so I don't know. I feel like my best hours are those hours before the rest of the day has had a chance to work on me. Similar for you? Yeah, I mean, I have um, no children. All I have is a very old dog, so I have uh, fewer things uh, calling on my time. I mean, I, t I teach and stuff like that, but I have more, a little bit more time just in the day every day. Um, but I, I, similar, what's similar for me is definitely working in the morning. Uh, I, I used to think that I, I used to say that I worked better at night, but I realized that was just a, a rationalization to avoid working in the morning. <laughs> and then night came, and I was like, well, I'm pretty tired, so I might have, um, yeah, so uh, most useful work I get done is between six and, and 10, um, before I, yeah, before everything gets in the way. Yeah. Could you do it without coffee? Um, there was a time when I did, but now I, yeah, we, now my wife goes to work much earlier than me and there's just always coffee already made and so I just come downstairs and, um, yeah, so why would I not drink it if it's there? <laughs> yeah. No, I just remember um, reading an interview with one writer in particular who talked about how he gave up cigarettes and he had to learn how to write after that, learn, had to relearn how to write because it was such an intellectual and emotional crutch. Sure. I wonder if I started smoking if it would get easier. <laughs> I, Only one way to find out. <laughs> yeah, just to should, see. You should what try. Works. <laughs> you know, you get it for, for, for my, car, my craft. Yeah. <laughs> so. How do you both bear writing so sad things? Oh, that's an, actually a good question. Uh, <laughs> so Best ones not, I shouldn't sound so surprised, but you know. Um, you can go first since oh, this is gonna, your family. I was, was going to show it. Oh, I yeah, I can. Toss it at you. Uh, <laughs> so there's sadness in this book, but there's a lot of... Um, humor too. Karen's actually really funny. Um, you've heard me read the first chapter a couple times, and that's really the bummer chapter is what it's known as in the trade. But once the plot gets started, because Karen's, because Jake's dad shows up, and Karen has to deal with her, all of her, she's feeling a lot of stuff, and she's angry, and she's smart, and she's, you know, she's she's a funny person, and when you're a funny person like you are, you get to sort of see the world and the world becomes a funny place. And that makes life better. And it makes Karen's life better. So I didn't think of this as writing a sad book, even though there were moments of sadness. I thought about it as writing Karen's book. And Karen, the, the narrator, is much more than her illness. Karen is a lot of things, and the illness is a very small part of it. So yeah, it didn't feel like I was writing a sad thing and sort of like, Tom and the dishwasher, I didn't realize that it was such a sad thing until other people reacted to it. Yeah, I am um, kind of similar, like where I think that balance really helps people to process something. I mean, if, if the book stays just really sad from page one through page 250 or whatever, 
number. It's hard. Some people will stick with it, but a lot of people won't, right? They need something to balance it out. And so in the same, same way with my book, once he hits the road, a bunch of weird stuff happens, basically. And he's remind, he, he never stops being sad, but then he, it's, you're caught up more in the, the movement of the, the, the plot. Um, I mean, I've always written... I mean, when I started writing, I always wrote about really sad stuff for whatever reason. I always think I was a sad kid. I, uh, <laughs> so, um, but it wasn't until much later that I realized that you could write about it in a way that wasn't just sad the whole time from start to finish. That, like, probably I read, I read George Saunders, actually. That's probably when I realized you could write about, like, impossibly sad people in a funny way. Um, but yeah, I think it's the humor is, is what makes it bearable. And also, I, and I just think it's fun. Uh, sad people are a lot more interesting to write about, I think, than uh, people who seem fine. <laughs> <laughs> well, do you both think that humanity is fundamentally sad or, some, or humorous or more complex? Yeah, and I think agglomeration? It's, it's all of that, right? But I think that it's sort of like, like, you know, seasoning, like you, in order to bring out the sadness, sometimes you need a little bit of humor, and in, in order to make things funny, sometimes you need to temper it with a bit of sadness, and I, I really respond, like one of the reasons I love Tom's book so much is that it is so absurd and funny and also so heartbreaking, and those are the two things I like to see in a, in a book. Um, and life, I think, is just sort of like that, and I, I remember, you know, at times in my family that have been really hard, bizarre things have happened, and they've seemed incredibly funny in ways that they might not have seemed if everything else had been okay. Was that in retrospect? No, I mean, my, so this is, I mean, this is like, we'll just, I'm just gonna double down on the horror show here. So my grandmother, who I loved a lot, was killed. She was crossing the street. She was hit by a car in the street she'd lived on for 50 years. It was just whiplashingly horrifying. And then um, my brother came home, you know, we were all gathering for the funeral, and <laughs> he was going to get the mail, and he tripped. I mean, it's not like a big deal, and he fell on his face, which is the sort of thing we would, might tease him about gently under other circumstances. He almost peed his pants laughing. It was, it was really, uh, it was a great pratfall, <laughs> but it just broke something. It just broke the sadness by just because it was totally absurd. And I'll never forget, how, I mean, we laughed for way too long and way too hard, not in retrospect, in, in, in that moment. Yeah, in the moment. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I think, um, I mean, they're, they're, they've been, the ideas of, of humor and tragedy have been paired forever, right? Uh, that you dating, yeah, ancient Greek plays and stuff that are playing on both of those things. And so I think they're just kind of, they're two sides of the same coin to me, that like some of the funniest books I've ever read are incredibly, I mean, like think like a classic one like Slaughterhouse-Five, right? Which is like, which is about a genocide and is mostly, I mostly remember for being very funny, uh, which is, uh, and then there are other books that are, um, that, that, that kind of pull off that same trick, where I think it's, I'm gonna say, dis it's sort of inauthentic to pretend that that's not there still, uh, most of the time, uh, that there's not something where people are even desperate to laugh at a stupid joke just to release some of that, that pressure. And in that way too, I think you know it, a reader sometimes is very happy to have that release and be, be saved from feeling terrible. Right. How are these books different from work you've done before? So this book's in the point of view of a woman, which I've never done before. Every other novel I've written has from, been from the POV of a man. This was because I really wanted to be taken seriously as a writer. Um, and I had learned watching other women writers that the best way to do it was to be a man. <laughs> Uh, and it turned out that worked. It worked really well. Um, I got good reviews for writing a um, man. Um, this book is the first book that I've written um, from the point of view of a woman, from the point of view of a mother. It's the first book I've written where I've attempted to um, show physical change over the course of a book. Karen starts off healthier than she ends up, and yet, I didn't want it to just be sort of a doctor's report. I was really trying to show how character, other characters treat her as she gets more sick. And I've noticed, I, I try not to in myself, but I certainly noticed that people are very uncomfortable around sick people often, and, or disabled people, that we, we act as though they aren't us, or they couldn't be us one day. They, we act as though they're somehow other. And I really tried in writing this book to make that clear that people start to push her away a little bit as it becomes more and more clear that she's sick. And that was 
that was a challenge as a writer that I'd never tried before, to show someone's physical state in terms of other people's reactions. Um, so for me, in one way, the, the, this book and my memoir are, are similar in that, so the memoir was basically driven by the, I, I started writing about the, my, my dad died when I was 20, and we started the sports angle is sort of this father-son bonding thing. Um, so in one way, both books are following a very similar thing of like a young man dealing with grief. What I, but I didn't, I was actually pretty conscious of trying not to just write the same book except eight years later. Um, and part of the biggest change is that, uh, unlike the memoir, there's actually a plot in this book uh, where the memoir was just, uh, you can get away with a lot less structure in, in, in long nonfiction, I think. Um, or at least I did. Um, so in here, part of it was first trying to really, trying really hard to make sure this character was not just me, uh, even though I, we were both 29. He was, he's 29 in the book, I was 29 when I started the book, but um, aside from that, it, I, I had to make a real conscious effort to make sure he was a, actually a fictional character who wasn't just a slightly different version of me, and then, then the actually moving a plot, having to shape it, which is not the thing that comes naturally to me at all. Uh, I have some friends, I know Lauren is a big fan of plot and teaches classes on plot. I have some friends who have just documents full of these complex, great plots, and I don't have that. My documents are like interesting sentences or uh, you know, a characteristic or something, and that. so it's a much more of a grind for me to figure out how to shape something in an interesting way and move someone from one place to another place and have people care where they're going. Um, yeah, so I think that's probably the biggest difference. I thought the, the second person was w working. I was just curious, um, what did you feel like you were gaining by using that and, and what were the challenges in, mm -hmm. in writing that way? Um, first, thank you. Um, the, the thing that it gets me most excited about any book I'm reading is voice. Uh, I, it, that's, um, I mean, I love a good plot, I love any, all the other stuff, but like, the books that I remember the most are ones that just have a memorable voice. And so for this, once I started writing, I said, oh, that's what I want to sound like. You know, that's, that's the thing that I want a book to sound like that I can write. And I just hope I can keep it going. You know, that's, um, thank goodness I ended up feeling pretty okay about it. Um, so what I got from it was the sound. I felt like the, um, it, the, the balance between the sadness and the humor, the momentum, the, the pacing of it, everything, it just felt really good writing it. Um, I had more fun writing the second person chapters than I've had writing any, anything else. Uh, and the challenge though was definitely, I mean, a very kind of basic challenge of writing second person to me is sometimes you, the word you shows up in every sentence and it is just really annoying. Uh, it's just annoying to hear and to see on the page. Um, That's why sometimes I tried to move into kind of like this imperative kind of voice. Um, but then the other challenge definitely uh, was trying to find a way, I just really didn't think I'd be able to sustain it for, it probably out of, I think this is 280 pages, it's probably 80 pages second person, the rest is, is third. Um, maybe, I, maybe I didn't have enough faith in myself, but I definitely did not as I, was, as I was writing it. First draft was all second person, and it just felt, it started to feel like a grind. Um, like I got halfway through and I was really bored, and that's, that's a huge red flag, <laughs> so. Um, yeah, that's where I ended up making the switch. Would you talk about your use of person? Because uh, while it's obviously first, it's also, um, you, you seem to slide into second because you're addressing yeah. the Yeah, Yeah, so um, she talks directly to Jake, and people, you know, it, I wasn't thinking of it as a conceit. Some of the reviews have called this like a conceit or a frame but that's not actually how I thought about it at all. The book wouldn't exist if she wasn't writing it for Jake. The whole point of having this book is to have a document for her son. So without the son, there'd be no book. And so it, it forced her to occasionally talk to him. I really imagined what I would write to, my, to a kid like Jake were I this woman. And what I would write would be a certain amount of my own history and a certain amount of instruction. And the instruction is in second person. I hope you are a good neighbor. I hope you remember to vote. I hope you check for lumps. You should, you know, try not to care too much about stuff. Try to care a little bit more about people. And when she does that, it's uh, imperative, but it's also directed towards one person, and that one person is, is the you, and the you is the child that she's imagining as a young adult. And she really 
strange. She's like, maybe there will be holograms in your future. Maybe you will, <laughs> uh, what, on what vessel will you be reading this book? But, uh, but she does have this very specific you in mind. And you're also able in that format to shift into, I mean, in the, what you read, that you're able to shift into a specific scene too, yeah. kind of like tr very traditional first person right. scene. Yeah, right. so. Like remember the giraffe thing. Yeah. I kn you both teach, were you breaking rules you teach your students as you moved along through the book? You know, the stuff that I teach my students is pretty, um, I, I like to think that there aren't that many rules besides, you know, like read a lot, edit yourself, you know, don't give me too many comma splices or I won't be able to read it, and um, work really hard. And then whatever ends up happening on the page, if those things seem in evidence, if it's clear the student's reading and working hard and paying attention to the basic rules of grammar, <laughs> you know, then I'm thrilled. And then whatever else is on the page, whatever else the student's trying to do, I don't, it, you know, I try not to come at that student with rules. I try to just come up with guidance. Um, the rules that I break right now, like I'm, I tell my students I want them to be writing all the time, and I currently am not. And that's something I will hang my head about later. But <laughs> I, I, I just really want, I think the thing that I, so I'm gonna totally, I'm gonna, answer the opposite of your question. The advice that I would give my students that I really felt in writing this book is that if you don't love what you're doing, don't do it. And I really loved writing this book. I really felt engaged and energized writing this book. And it's the only reason to do it because there's no other real reward, frankly. Everything else is just all nervous nail chewing. So um, I tell them, you know, I want you guys to love what you're doing. And if you don't love what you're doing, do something else. Yeah, that's, that's advice that I got when I was in school and I didn't listen and I kept trying to force books to happen, assuming that at some point genius just kicks in somewhere and it never did uh, <laughs> at all. Uh, so there's a lot of really bad books on my computer uh, because I just was like, I felt like I needed to have a long document in my and sort of word suffer processor. For it, yeah. Right? yeah, but there, I don't know, I guess there was value to it, to writing badly for a while, but I don't know. I probably wasted a lot of energy. Uh, stressing about it. Um, I used to have very rigid rules as a teacher and I've relaxed just about all of them over the years as I've seen basically because what you see when you have really rigid rules you see um, brilliant students break them and you say oh this is great. Uh, you say you know, don't write stories with uh, warlocks and stuff and then they write one and you say oh that's really good. <laughs> uh, of course you can write that. Uh, basically every rule I've had uh, some really smart student showed me how dumb my rule was uh, and so uh, in the same way now, I'd say one in middle drafts of this book, the, uh, a guideline that I would be breaking is that trying, is just explaining everything, you know? So when I'm reading drafts of stuff that students write, I'm always just cutting out the last paragraph or last two paragraphs or last page of the things they're writing. Uh, not always, a lot of times. Because uh, it's usually just like they, they have this great ending and then they add two pages of epilogue to try to explain how interesting their ending was. Um, and that's, my middle drafts are full of that. That's why I'm so sensitive to it when they write it, is you know, I have this snappy line of dialogue or whatever, and then I have four lines explaining how clever my dialogue was. Uh, and so, um, you know, the rule that I have to get over for myself all the time is uh, getting over my perception of my own intelligence uh, <laughs> and stop patting myself on the back, basically. Well, thank you both very much. Thank Lauren you. Lauren Brodstein, Tom McCallum,